What is up everyone and welcome back to my channel where I, Financial Coach Jess, give you money strategies for college grads. I know I've said this before, I feel like I say it all the time, but you cannot work your way into wealth. So many people believe that if they just had a higher paying job, then they would be able to become wealthy. If they just worked more hours, they always gotta work more hours, work more jobs, then they would be able to become wealthy. And this is false teaching. You literally, you cannot, you cannot work your way into wealth. There aren't enough hours in a day. And quite honestly, there's not enough days in our lives to be able to generate millions of dollars from our workplace. So what is the solution? How do people do it? How do they retire? Here's the secret. You have to have your money work for you. Let me put it this way for you. The majority of the population that is trying to build wealth are doing the following. They're trying to work longer hours. They're trying to get higher paying jobs and they're trying to cut expenses. And here's the issue with all of those components, they are finite. They are limited. You can only work so many hours in a day. You can only cut your expenses so far. What I teach in my own financial coaching program is that yes, we want to do our best with those things. We want to maximize those things, but at the same time, you're not going to get wealthy from cutting out $5 coffee twice a week. We have to look at what is limitless, what is scalable, and the answer to that is investing. Make your money work for you while you're sleeping, while you're on vacation, while you're working, while you're relaxing on a Sunday. 24-7, your money is going to be working for you. And this creates a super valuable stream of income. I hope this is making sense to you because this could be a very new way of looking at your income. I know growing up in America, we're taught go to school so you can get a good job, so you can get a good income. And that's all good. That's all good things. But it's missing the secret sauce of investing. Investing allows us allows our money to multiply while we go about our life. Why are some people absolutely killing the investing game while other people are not investing at all? I think one of the reasons for that is information overload. With the internet, it's a great thing. We have tons of information, but with unlimited information also becomes decision paralysis. And instead of implementation, people get stuck in the research space, they don't know who to trust, and it's just this huge information overload. I think another big reason for this is financial illiteracy. So thinking that social security is going to be enough, being unaware of how expensive assisted living is and healthcare is when you're 80, 90, 100 years old. I think another reason is debt. People get stuck in the credit card cycle. They're paying off their student loans until they're in their 40s and their 50s, and investing just isn't on their mind. They can't think that far ahead because they're still paying off stuff that they bought in the past. I think some people are just skeptical and very fearful. They're afraid of making the wrong decision or making the wrong investment. And instead of channeling those emotions toward investing, we actually want to take those same emotions and channel them toward not investing. They, these are the dangers and the fears you should be experiencing if you are not investing and you're avoiding it. And another reason is I think people are just winging it and they've been winging it for so long. Either they have family to fall back on or they've been bailed out of bad decisions in the past and they think that this is going to most likely happen again. And this is when we get grandparents that are relying on their children to financially support them and their children also have children that they're financially supporting and it really just becomes this huge mess when people are winging their finances. Let's talk for a moment about what investing is not. Investing is not putting your money into a high yield savings account. I love high yield savings account, but the purpose of it is not to invest. It's not to see your money multiply seven, eight, nine times while you sleep, right? The interest rate on a high yield savings account is usually between one and two percent. With inflation being pretty close to three percent, this is actually going to give us a negative return over the long haul. So high yield savings account, even though I love them, they are not investing. Investing is also not just putting money into a IRA, a Roth IRA, or a brokerage account. This can be a devastating mistake 
mistake because people just dump money into these accounts, but that's the first step. Then you have to actually invest the money once it's in that account. Without investing the money once it's in those accounts, it's basically just a savings account. Your money isn't actually doing anything. So make sure once you transfer the money into an IRA, a Roth IRA, you then take that money and invest it. Here's a helpful graphic to depict big picture investing through a brokerage. I used Charles Schwab, Vanguard, and Fidelity as my examples. These are companies where you can open tax advantaged accounts like an IRA, a Roth IRA to invest in. Like I said, it's not enough to just dump the money in there. You have to then take that money and invest it. With an IRA or a Roth IRA, you can invest your money in anything. So this could be mutual funds, index funds, specific funds like the S&P 500 or target date index funds or a combination of all of that. It's good to have a plan and a balanced, diversified portfolio and not just pick random funds or funds that you are familiar with. Inside of those funds, we have bonds and stocks. Here are some examples of the possible stocks. Amazon, Microsoft, Nike, Netflix, Facebook, Adobe, PayPal, Verizon, Coca-Cola, MasterCard. This is tricky because this is very different from a 401k. Typically with a 401k, you have standard plans or tiers that you can choose from. And once you choose that, the percentage of your paycheck is automatically taken out of your check and invested. But with a Roth IRA, with an IRA, this is not the case. I'm gonna say it one more time. Once you dump the money in there, you then have to take the money and invest it yourself. Another piece of very crucial information when it comes to investing for beginners is paying special attention to the expense ratio of what you are investing in. So what is an expense ratio? Let's start there. A very boiled down definition of the expense ratio would be the percentage of the fund's total assets that will be used to cover expenses. These expenses could be administrative, management, advertising, or other smaller expenses. These operating expenses reduce the fund's assets, thereby reducing the return to investors. High expense ratios are very, very bad for the investor, which is you. And by the way, a high expense ratio is like 1%. If this is new information for you, I know for a fact right now you're thinking, Jess, 1% is not hi, you need to calm down. But here's the thing, you have got to think of it this way. A 1% fee on your total asset, if you get an 8% return on that asset, 1% fee takes that return down to 7%. So guess what? You just lost 12.5% of your total return. Boom math. You're going to want to rewind and watch that again because your 1% fee that was really, really small just turned into a 12.5% fee. Seriously, don't gloss over this. If that didn't make sense to you, rewind that and watch it again. This is so important. Here's a very real life example. Let's say you have a million dollars sitting in a mutual fund with a 1% expense ratio. Over the course of a year, that 1% is costing you $10,000, but it gets worse. Not only are you losing out on that $10,000, but you're losing out on the interest that that $10,000 would have gained you. Now, times all of that by 10 years, 15 years, you just lost out on hundreds of thousands of dollars because of that 1% fee. And here's some more examples for you. Let's say your portfolio holds $5,000. A low expense ratio of 0.14% would be a fee of $7. However, a 1% expense ratio would be $50. This isn't huge, right? You can see the difference, but we can't really do the compounding math in our head with such small numbers like this. Take a look at the middle here. Your $100,000 investment could have a 0.14% expense ratio again, and the fee would be 140. 
or with a 1% expense ratio, this would be $1,000. These are quite a bit different now. Not only are you losing out on that $1,000 every year, but you're losing out on the interest that the $1,000 would have generated for you year after year after year. You can see the stark difference at the bottom again with the million dollars. Compounding interest messes up the straightforward math that we are used to. It turns 1% into hundreds of thousands of dollars lost over the lifetime of an investment. Hopefully you're starting to see that this 1% matters. Actually, I would say anything over 0.7% is becoming very, very expensive when it comes to investments. By industry standard, I'll reiterate again, anything over 0.7% is becoming very expensive. And you can see from the math that we've done today, it really erodes a lot of money away from your investments over its lifetime. You you really, really want to strive to get low expense ratios on your investments. And by low, I mean anything really under 0.2% is going to be good. Obviously, the lower the better in terms of expense ratios. A quick side note here is that if you're working with an advisor, there could be other fees besides the expense ratio. So these could look like monthly maintenance fees, annual fees, marketing fees, transaction fees. So really be aware. There's other fees on your investments. You need to be well-versed on what those are. So far in this video, I've warned you about the accounts. You can't just dump money in the accounts. You actually have to invest that money. And I've also warned you about expense ratios. We're shooting for very low expense ratios. My third piece of very crucial advice for beginner investors is to not put so much emphasis on the individual price of a stock or a fund. The share price is very counterintuitive, very similar to the expense ratio. Our common sense wants to kick in and say, 1%, who cares? That's like nothing, right? But with the share price, we want to think, oh, this price is really, really low. So the company must not be very big or the share must not be worth very much or the company must not be growing. And then we see a share that has a really big price on it. And we're like, wow, this company must be growing really fast or this company must be doing great. But here's the truth. The share price of an individual stock or fund is actually pretty irrelevant unless you only compare it to itself over time. In order to compare that share to anything else, you have to know how many shares there are and the size of those shares. You cannot just compare the prices. That it doesn't make any sense. When you just look at the price of a share, that doesn't tell you anything about the company, the size of the share, or the future or past results of the share. You cannot draw conclusions or compare shares unless you look at all of the data. If this is really, really new information for you, or if you just literally didn't understand a word that I said in this video, you have got to sign up for my financial coaching program, and I will leave the link below for you to learn more. Let me know below what other advice would you give to beginning investors. Don't forget to like this video if you got value out of it and subscribe to my channel. I'll see you guys in the next one.